do we have a sufficiently good definition of life for us to then know the moment you may have created it? Yeah, so um, there's many definitions of life out there, right? And, and there's not really consensus on one, but I would say in my field, bottom-up synthetic biology, um, what we really use as a working definition, and you'll be happy to hear this, Neil, is um, a self-sustaining chemical um, system capable of Darwinian evolution. And that definition was put forward by the NASA. Um, and we extend it. We, we don't just want a system capable of Darwinian evolution. We actually want a system capable of open-ended evolution. So it can essentially increase itself in complexity. It can evolve to perform um, any desired task in the end. So that's what we are after. So, so what's the, sorry, what's the difference between Darwinian evolution and open evolution? Um, so Darwinian evolution can be, there can be open-endedness in, in Darwinian evolution. So um, what, what we are really after is, is a system where the evolutionary landscape is large enough so that at any given time, um, the number of genotypes only um, exploit a sufficient, sufficiently small um a uh, small space on that evolutionary landscape, so to say. So there is really, there is really a lot of space to introduce um, serendipity, to introduce uh, changes, to introduce um, well, also some some kind of emergent properties that uh, that are inherent to living systems. So Darwinian would presume that the change is favored only for the survival of the organism, and you're suggesting there might be forces operating that just simply change the organism without reference to its survival. Is that a fair way to think about open-ended yeah. evolution? Yeah. Well, yeah. To essentially, to essentially go for systems that increase in complexity and do interesting things. So that's what we are after. So if an organism never dies or lives sufficiently long, then it can't undergo Darwinian evolution. So on the population level, I think introducing death into, into living systems is absolutely crucial because um, otherwise, you know, um, you just have exponential growth and the resources will be exploited. I never heard anybody say that before. We have to make sure you die in order to, that, for us to evolve you. That kind of, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, again, that, that sort of a little mind blowing, but yeah, of, co I, of course. I'm not saying it doesn't make sense. I'm just saying I never heard anybody admit that. Yeah. <laughs> So you're the first biologist I've heard be honest about the fact that Darwinian evolution requires that everybody dies. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, on the population at level, level at least, when we think about synthetic cells, we, we really think about very, very minimal and living entities that are much simpler than the simplest cell that we currently know on Earth. So much simpler. We are really talking something where essentially we are, we want to get to the point where chemical evolution becomes biological evo evolution, right? That's where we want to get. And in that context, I'm saying that if we manage to construct a system which is capable of self-replication, then um, eventually resources will be exploited, especially if you have, if you have, of course, limited resources, right? And in this stage, this is where, you know, we have a situation where survival of the fittest is what's driving evolution, essentially. We have a situation <laughs> <laughs> on our hands. <laughs> so so this, this conversion from complex chemistry to simple biology, uh, that harkens back to the Miller-Urey experiment, very famous experiment. When was that? In the 1960s, was it? Uh, perhaps early 70s. Could you remind us about the Miller and Urey experiment? And what that did in your field back then? Yeah, so I think it was earlier even than that. It was around 1950, 1952 or so. Where oh, the 50s, okay. Yeah, so um, so it was the first time um, that essentially uh, Miller was, was, uh, was performing chemical reactions in a way that is uh, kind of similar to the to early Earth, to the, to the environment on early Earth. So he was trying to recreate the atmosphere that was present on early Earth. And then um, he could see that very simple building blocks of life, such as some amino acids, which build proteins, so to say, um, were present in that solution after he, after he uh, provided the system with energy. Um, so that kind of showed that organic synthesis is possible under prebiotic conditions, essentially. Um, 
and you know that's far away from from a biological system so we're talking really individual amino acids but it shows that prebiotic conditions can give rise to organic molecules like amino acids that build proteins today so in the miller urey experiment they knew to start with organic molecules right they knew to start with that and they went to then see what the organic molecules might do for themselves mm -hmm. let when left unmonitored and left alone but they had to give it an energy source right and if memory serves that energy source was a little spark very frankenstein like simulating lightning so to say on early earth yeah you want a big light want, switch or something? Oh yeah, I want a massive. I want a massive lever that someone that a henchman. Do you have a henchman? You, I, I'm hoping you have a henchman. <laughs> I'm afraid not. But what I what I find interesting about about this experiment is that you know even before that, about hundred years earlier, um, there was the common belief among chemists at the time was that organic molecules are molecules which can only be synthesized by living things, right? Like uh, that organic synthesis in the laboratory is essentially impossible. And then chemists at the time, like 1800 something, managed to actually make the first organic molecule synthetically in the lab, and that was actually urea. And that proved that we as human beings can synthesize organic molecules which are otherwise made by living things from scratch right and i see synthetic biology or the bottom-up creation of synthetic life a little bit at a similar at a similar point right now where you know kind of a proof of principle is needed to show that we cannot only make organic molecules like the ones that were uh, that were made in the miller urey experiment but that we can also actually achieve a transition from matter to life in a laboratory setting how does your work follow this? And what is, what's different about your approach? So essentially we start at a much, much later point. So we, um, start when, uh, we start with biomolecules and we ask ourselves the question whether it's possible to actually assemble molecules in such a way that we can create a system that's capable of undergoing, uh, that, uh, create a, a self-sustaining chemical system that's capable of uh, of evolution. So that's, that's, that's um, our starting point and end goal. And what we do um, in order to get there is um, we, are, we are making lipid vesicles, so kind of the envelope of a cell, and we are building, constructing our own molecular machinery, and we do so with RNA, RNA nanotechnology. Um, and that may be a little bit reminiscent of um, the RNA world hypothesis and the origins of life. Thank you.